We've existed in our current form for over five years now, and we've spent a lot of our time firefighting, so talking about bollards and new developments and white lines, and it's very boring. So we wanted to do something that was more interesting, because we thought, we're more than this, cycling is more than this. We wanted to create something which would categorically show how important, how vital cycling is, not just for cyclists themselves, but for every resident of York. And so, 42 Ways to Transform York was born. But what is it? Well, it's a manifesto. It's our vision for how York can be an all-around better place for everybody if we get people out of private cars and onto bicycles. It's not a policy document. That's the Civic Trust's Transport Strategy for York, and Tony May is going to be talking about that um, after Andy and I have finished introducing 42 Ways, so hold that thought. We don't go into a great deal of detail because we aren't transport engineers or technocrats, because we wanted to keep it accessible to the general public, and we know that the average person on the street doesn't really want to read about junctions. So it's quite clinical, and our intention is to be provocative. Libertarians are focused on freedom too, and not freedom from, and that's what we're talking about here, so the freedom from pollution, the freedom from the dangers caused by, by pollution, by congestion, by lack of exercise, by all of the things that, um, that cycling brings about. Now we've divided the document into four sections, and all of it's based on facts and data. And section one is the general improvements to life that cycling can make. So, it shouldn't all be about the money, but let's face it, when you're talking to the people who make the changes, it's often about the money. In terms of the local economy, cyclists spend more than motorists over the course of a year. And that might not make sense when you first think about it, but it's because cyclists make more journeys, um, and by, by, by less each time, they make more journeys. So altogether, it's um, something which is very interesting because shopkeepers often overestimate how many people go by car, and in fact, Cyclists are the ones that are spending the money. People are happier in cities which prioritise active travel. Now, this is quite a difficult one to quantify, but um, the facts correlate. If you look at the cities that are highest on the happiness index, on the quality of life index, they correlate directly with cities that have embraced active travel, so cycling and walking. York is a historic city, and it was never designed for cars, but bicycles fit quite naturally. Ultimately, cycling makes for happier and healthier people. And when we come to design for anything, we shouldn't be designing for drivers, we should be designing for people. Now, section two is about building a coherent cycling network, and for that, I'm going to hand over to Andy Shaw. So let's talk about York's so called cycling network. There's no doubt about it, York is absolutely made for cycling. It's relatively flat, it enjoys a mild climate. It's a compact city where you can get just about anywhere on a bike in 20 minutes, and there are plenty of existing cyclists. And it even has a few decent cycle, uh, cycleways. The problem is, they don't all go very far. Too many of them are on busy roads and not protected from motor vehicles. They don't always lead where people actually want to go, and they don't join up. So we have a fragmented cycle network. At the heart of this problem, are two related factors. The first is that cycling is banned in the city centre footstreets. Sadly, when the city centre was closed to cars in the late 80s, the project inherited all the cycle blind prejudices of the day. Cyclists were at best seen as a nuisance and at worst as a danger to pedestrians. And yet, we know from the experience of dozens of other cities that cyclists and pedestrians can coexist safely in the same spaces. In 42 ways, we start the example of Ghent in Belgium. We can also look close to home, such as Leicester, which I visited last week. Our campaign is not demanding unrestricted cycle access. We are simply asking for accessible and direct routes through the centre. Banned from the city centre, cyclists are often forced to mix it with hostile traffic on some of York's most congested roads. If we are ever to address the long-term decline of cycling in this city. It will take some effort and imagination, but we could start with reducing more vehicle speeds. Lots more safe and direct crossing points for cycling and pedestrians, not situated in random places where they are now, but along long known desire lines, and a reallocation of some of the road capacity away from cars to the alternatives. An easy win is set out in way 16 of our document. 
So section three is about making York accessible for everyone. So for that, I want to talk about some assumptions that are often made. One assumption is that everyone owns a car. When we talk about, um, when we talk about transport, there's this assumption that just everybody's a driver, and that simply isn't true. One third of society does not have access to a vehicle. There's an assumption that all motorists drive all the time. All of us do different things at different times. I'm the chair of the cycle campaign and I have a car. There's an assumption that disabled people can't cycle. But Wheels for Wellbeing, which is a charity which specialises in cyclists with disabilities, find that the majority of their members find cycling to be easier than walking. There's an assumption that a cyclist is a lycra-clad, able-bodied man. Now, in the Netherlands, they have two separate words for cyclists. Um, a wheel runner is a fast cyclist, and a pizza is somebody who gets around by bicycle. They're two separate things. I don't have a problem with people who want to wear lycra to cycle, and a lot of the time I don't have a problem with men either. But I do have a problem when people assume that just because I cycle, that must be me. In this document, we are primarily focusing on cycling for transport. So the type of cycling that, that's the type of journey that could be done by car or walking, but people have chosen to cycle it instead. That's what we're looking at. But as long as we continue this cultural understanding that cyclists are just people who are going around for fun, we're never going to be able to treat it as it deserves to be and give it the space that it needs in the cities so that people can actually move around. There's an assumption that consultations are representative, but they need to involve everybody, not just the usual suspects and the loudest voices. Ultimately, when we build for the most vulnerable in society, it means that everybody has access. And that means whether it's disability, or gender, or financial position, when we make sure that the least able are able to use these cycle routes, then everybody is going to be able to use them. It should be evident by now that we are not exactly fans of the status quo in York. <coughs> and we're not alone. According to surveys, pretty much everyone in the city agrees that excessive car traffic is a major problem that undermines the quality of life in the city. So why are we in this position? To be blunt, I think our leaders, the politicians and senior council officers have been sleeping on the job for the last decade. Clearly, there's been no transport strategy to speak of, certainly not one that is fit for purpose. What we do have is the local transport plan, aka LTP3, from 2011, which is supposed to run until 2031. I would say the LTP was a failure before it was even launched. It never asked the fundamental questions <coughs> and lacks any concrete aspiration or measures of achievement. And this failure perhaps originates in York's larger failure to come up with a local plan. What we do have is years of policy making on the hoof, one that has resulted in a gradual but a continuous accommodation of car dependency with profoundly negative consequences for this city. So, as we say in YA27, get a strategy. And so to finish off, I'd like to highlight three broad, broad themes that we'd like to see applied. Ways 29 and 30, we have a transport hierarchy that's set out in that LTP3 and as of last year it's been endorsed by the Highway Code. It states that pedestrians, people with mobility problems, cyclists and public transport users should take precedence in transport policy. So we ask that in York that the council follows it and please make the money follow it too. Put your money where the hierarchy Way 32. Ooh, skip ahead. Stop trying to fix congestion. Instead, recognise it for what it is a powerful disincentive for people to drive. Ways 35, 37, 40. Look at the parking. <coughs> Most cars are not in motion or even stuck in traffic jams. Most cars are parked out 96% of the time. And to accommodate them, they are gifted large amounts large swathes of public land, often public land. Um, in cities like York, land is a premium. We could use it for better things. We could use it for desperately needed housing, we could use it for green spaces, we could use it for economic activity, or dare I say it, say it we could use it for cycle lanes. 
Councils have considerable powers to regulate parking, and it's a power that York should be using more often and in much more imaginative ways. So who do we want to read this document? We're not going to be around Bush, everyone. But really, we want people who don't currently cycle. We want people who are on the fence, who are thinking that they might like to cycle but they're not quite sure yet. Read this and understand why it will make all the difference. We want people who want a better life and who know that York is congested and polluted and inaccessible, but aren't quite sure what to do about it. Who know that it shouldn't be the same as quo, but something needs to change. What can change? This can change. People who visited Amsterdam or Copenhagen or Ghent and maybe can't quite, quite put their finger on what it is about those cities which would make them such enjoyable places to live. Not just easy to get around, but happy people too. We would like to build our numbers as a cycle campaign because the larger we are, the more of a force we have when we speak to the council. So if you're not already a member, please do sign up. And we want people who share our vision to help us build it. We want to argue about this because we really believe our points that we've made here. The bicycle is older than the car, but ironically, embracing active travel is to move forwards, not backwards. We believe that the world can be a better place and York can be a better place. And if you want to know how, please read our document and find out. As Andy mentioned, we have a local transport plan. It was published in 2011. It is strictly still valid, uh, although all the detailed elements peaked about in 2016. And of course, if you think about what's happened in the 12 years since, we've had austerity, we've had cuts in bus services, we've had a pandemic, uh, everything has changed. We've also got major changes in availability, things like communication rather than travel, um, of sharing of facilities of electric vehicles. So basically, the 2011 local transport plan is out of date. Um, the government has said it wants all local authorities to produce new local transport plans, and the latest target for that is uh, July next year. Um, you will probably know that we are lined up to have a mayoral combined authority by then jointly with North Yorkshire. And the government has said, it's not just a York plan, it has to be York and North Yorkshire one. And North Yorkshire have very different needs from us. So what we've got to do over basically 12 months is to produce a plan for York, discuss it with North Yorkshire, come up with something that is a joint and convincing plan. Um, now that's the background. Um, at the moment, um, the government has still not produced the guidance that it was promising, I think, a year ago now. But we do have guidance in this wonderful diagram here from the European Commission, uh, which amongst other things says what are the stages you have to go through, and each of these green circles is a point at which you should con consult the wider public. And it starts by asking about problems, it then asks about possible futures, what sort of future you want the city to have, what are going to be the main impacts on it. Um, it then looks at what you want the city to be like and the objectives of the transport, uh, plan. It then looks at broad strategy. Uh, it then goes down into detail, the sorts of things that Andy and Robin have been talking about, what needs to be done. Um, and then it consults on the detail of the plan. York has so far only done the first of those. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done in the next uh, 12 months. I'm delighted talking earlier this week to the incoming executive member for transport that he is now saying we need a draft of this document by September. Um, I'm not at all sure it will happen, uh, but we all need to be ready to contribute to that and comment on it. Um, 
Two and a half years ago, we were approached, we, the Civic Trust, were approached by the council and offers were saying we're going to produce a local transport plan by the end of 2021 and we welcome your input to it. So we beavered away. We did a review of uh, the current local transport plan. We weren't quite as critical as energy has been, but we did have our own comments and suggestions. Um, we did a detailed review of different elements of strategy, cycling being one, walking being one, public transport and so on. We carried out nine case studies at the Council's invitation to look at good practice elsewhere in the UK and also in Europe. Um, and um, we also uh, established a Citizens Transport Forum so that we were hearing from members of the public from around the city as to what they need. Um, sadly, the local transport plan wasn't delivered uh, in December 2021, so we produced our own thinking in February 2022. We started, as the guidance suggests, by saying what are the problems. But we didn't have to work very hard on this because our own surveys told us, and the council's surveys told us. The, the key problems are the ones listed here. You all know them, and I'm not going to go through them, but they're in some sort of rough order of uh, the frequency you mentioned. Congestion up at the top, pollution and carbon reduction. Um, we then asked ourselves, what do we want your to be like? And actually, that part of the question, the council answered in December when it produced its 10-year um, plan for the city. York will be a vibrant, prosperous, welcoming and sustainable city where everyone can share and take pride in its success. Absolutely fine, um, but it doesn't actually say anything directly about how transport contributes to that. And so we went to the next stage with our citizens transport forum, both before and after the pandemic, and got them to say, what would you like the transport plan to be delivering? And the highest priority, not surprisingly, because so those the most serious problems, were tackling congestion, tackling pollution, and tackling carbon emissions. The pandemic told us that public health and safety, and indeed the economy of the city, were pretty crucial. And then there's a set of objectives which are always there, and we don't we must avoid forgetting. First of all, improving access for everybody. And there are people in the city who have extremely poor public transport access, or because of a disability, have difficulty getting out at all. Our starting point is we need to reduce car dependency. If we can enable people to do things other than by car, we can help reduce car use. And it seems to us that there are six interconnected elements to this, all of which we need to do. I've highlighted active travel by um, on foot and by bike, because that's what we're talking about this evening. But I've actually started with something that isn't really a transport element itself. It's reducing the need to travel. Better communication, people living closer to um, shops and leisure activities and work, so that they don't have to travel as far, and then can more readily uh, walk and cycle. Improving public transport, Changing the way the road network is managed, and, and is already talked about the dreaded inner ring road, that's a classic example of the way in which the road network is set up for movement rather than as a place to be. Um, and then modifying freight operation, often overlooked completely, and modifying car use. And this little diagram with those six elements of strategy down the left and the nine objectives across the top says which of those bits of the strategy contribute to which objectives. And I take two messages from this. First of all, if you're pursuing a particular objective, there's a case for doing all six of those. And secondly, anything you do for cycling, for example, 
will contribute to most of the objectives that the city has. So we see this as a package in which each of those six elements helps your achieve what it wants to achieve. Um, so we need a plan, uh, and all being well, we will see uh, the basis of that plan in the next uh, few months, certainly by mid-autumn. But to implement the plan, first of all, we need to get the finance that's needed. And finance has become more and more restricted, particularly for running things. You can get capital funding, bizarrely, but you can't get the money to run the bus service. Um, so we really need to tackle that. And one of the lessons over the last decade is that if you have a plan and a convincing cost-effective set of measures, you can bid for funding. If you haven't got a plan, you're less likely to get money from government. But also, we need funding from third parties, whether it's developers um, or um, the car user paying for the way they use the road system. Um, so finance is critical. We need to build consensus. Uh, you don't have to spend very long looking at social media to see that people fire from the sidelines um, and never actually meet and agree on what needs to be done. That's one of the things we've been trying to do for our citizens' transport for them. And it's absolutely crucial, we think, that the council encourages that consensus. Um, and we need clear leadership. One of my very earliest involvements in um, uh, international transport uh, activities, um, more years ago than I care to remember, um, was a study looking at cities that have been successful. And we were thinking we were going to learn what they did that worked best. It wasn't as simple as that, but the message we got was a successful city needs two things. It needs a visionary politician who knows what they want to achieve, and it needs a senior uh, officer who is committed to delivering that and able to deliver it. So, that's all I wanted to say. Very happy to contribute to uh, discussion and questions. So, thanks very much. Um, if we could get a if we could get a route that would go to the city centre that is for cyclists, um, and we can show that, and I truly believe that this would happen, that the revenue would go up from those shops because cyclists would be able to go past and stop there. But hopefully, having that evidence of something happening in York would then encourage them to um, spread the make it easier for cyclists to go throughout the city. So it might be a case of, that's one way of, of doing it. I think. I'd like to answer that. Um, I'm a businessman myself. Um, I actually run a bike shop, so you might think I'm a bit biased on this, but actually a lot of our customers come by car. We have parking, a lot of them come from a long way, we might drive 50 miles for the kind of bikes that we sell. I think to answer your question is first of all, it depends on the kind of business. Um, there's, again, people are thinking in very broad, you know, very kind of stereotypical but um, there's a lot of evidence um, that when you 
in fact, which is why in bands when we created the Foot Streets, the, there was an absolute ferocious play in New York in the light, late 80s. So if you cre close the city centre to cars, we'll all go bust. But what happened? Totally the opposite happened. It became a really vibrant, viable place. Okay? Um, so oh, I'd like to put that down first. Sure, if you're a supermarket with a massive car park on the edge of town, you know, your whole business model is built around that. But if you look at our city centre, it's changed incredibly. It's no longer such a retail-heavy destination. It's much more about leisure and tourism and people spending time there. And that fits very nicely with cycling. Um, and you can look at other cities that embrace this model much, you know, much stronger way. I'd, I'd advise by anyone to go to a city in Denmark or, or the Netherlands and see how vibrant and wealthy and prosperous these cities are. Um, so it's not, you know, the car is not the Midas touch. And the other thing, obviously, as Robin says, is that um, people just get the optics all wrong. They don't really completely underestimate how many people walk in, uh, cycling in, or come other ways. The other thing I'd say is just go somewhere like central London or central Leeds. I mean, you know, people don't drive all the way to the shop. They'll drive somewhere in the park. We have a park and ride in this town, so there's lots, you know, it's quite a complicated picture. Hi, um, I just wanted to know how some of the other places like Amsterdam and Lentz and, and Leicester, how they got the car drivers to change their behavior. Because, um, you know, I, I, I live here around this area, and, and when I talk to car drivers, I mean, most of us, one time, I only go two or three miles to most destinations. So, you know, so can we learn something from them or what's our, and also what's our strategy for trying to change the behavior? Very interesting question and absolutely key. And I mentioned the importance of reducing car dependency. Um, and that has to do initially with providing alternatives. Uh, and the alternatives are things like walking and cycling and better public transport. They're also travelling less. And so anything you can do to promote communication rather than travel, shopping from home, working from home, studying from home, uh, anything you can do to uh, make um, the built-up area more mixed so that people can do things close to home rather than travelling long distances will help. But at the end of the day, you've almost certainly got to impose some restrictions as well. And there is a figure uh, in the Council's carbon strategy um, of a 70% reduction in carbon from transport by 2030 seven years away. And the draft local transport strategy that appeared in February suggests that requires a 20% reduction in car use by that time. I know of no city that has achieved a 20% reduction in car use simply by providing the alternatives. So we will have to think about ways in which car use is made more expensive or more difficult in certain areas. But in doing so, we've also got to protect those people who have no alternative. Thank you for um, presenting us with the water to ways as we just planned. I'm just wondering, how good, how good is the fit between those two plans? For, for example, um, I, I've read the 42 ways, and I think the main things are the city centre cycle routes and rumour busting. Do those two things come in the city trust plan as well? Um, if you'd like, we adopted a top-down approach, and groups like the cycle campaign have been thinking bottom up of what can be done. Um, but when I, I mentioned that what we were doing in the first half of 2021 was looking in some detail at walking, cycling, public transport, 
alternatives to travel, the road network and so on. And in doing that, we looked in each of those strategy documents at what could be done. And then in this document, we illustrated with a subset of those. So if you go into our detailed strategy, you will find almost everything that's in 42 ways. We were then a bit selective as to what we suggested might be done as an illustration. But I think, uh, even though the documents are written by different people, they do actually dovetail and support one another quite well. He's a long, quick <laughs> So you've explained how um, either council, I've got to work with North Yorkshire to put this plan forward sometime next year with government, and it's got a lot of stages and there'll be a lot of work. So could your work be used for any of that? Like how, how useful is the work that's already been done? Well, uh, I'm a bit biased on that. <laughs> um, can I be objective? I mean, we wrote it as a contribution, and when we were writing it and working with officers and with elected members, we discussed each stage with them. And we weren't getting a great deal of um, uh, negative response. I don't think there's very much in here that politicians in the council would find difficult. There are some that are more sensitive than others. Um, but this could readily be picked up as a starting point. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to ask about, about the point around um, consensus and conflict. Um, so, you know, how we kind of avoid some of the kind of culture wars rhetoric in this kind of domain, which, you know, if you look on social media, things seem extremely polarised. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I was particularly interested to tell you finding out more about the citizens' forums that the Trust ran and whether they perhaps showed that the views were perhaps not as polarised as you might otherwise kind of expect. So I guess I'm interested in that aspect and, and obviously also invite um, Robin and uh, Andy to talk about how we might build consensus in this area as well. Thank you. Well, let, let me start that off and I can certainly pass to Robin because Robin was heavily involved with our forum throughout its um, period of operation. We started with the survey in 2019. Um, we had about 1,500 responses from residents um, asking them about problems, asking them about possible solutions. And right at the end, we said, we're thinking of setting up um, a forum where people can come together and discuss these things. And we were building on recent experience elsewhere in the country and the world. Not just transport, but you may remember there was some climate change citizens forums at about this time. Um, and so there's quite a lot of evidence on good practice. We had no idea how many people would say yes. 440 did. So there was a real interest in contributing. Um, we only had funding for 100, but we did know something about the people who said yes, uh, including whether they regularly uh, got involved with the council. We thought it would be quite useful to get some of the people who didn't. So we had a bias towards the people who didn't regularly handle the council and comment on what they were doing. Um, but at the same time, we selected people from different parts of your gender, age, different travel experience. Um, and our hundred um, came together for the first time in February 2020, just before everything changed. Um, and I think Robin would agree, it was really interesting right from the outset how a group of six or seven round a table, and we had in total 15 of those, um, quite rapidly reached consensus. Um, they might have come saying, my problems are in this area, my problems are in that area, I need to use my car, I'm stuck, not having a bus. But they began 
to listen to one another and understand each other's needs. And what really convinced me this was happening was when they started looking around and said, well, we haven't got many disabled people here, or we haven't got many students. What do they need? So you can do it. Um, it if, I, I guess the main constraints are uh, getting people from parts of society that are less used to contributing. And back in March 2020, we did a report for the council that said, these are the people we've covered, these are the groups of people we know we're not covering adequately, we could help you if you wish, uh, try and fill those gaps. Those gaps still need to be filled, but um, it's, it's the basis, we think, for um, avoiding this polarised discussion by bringing people together and, and discussing common needs. Yeah, I, I mean, I completely agree. I'm sitting on that side of it. Um, I started as a, as a member of the, of the, I went to the forum um, to speak and I ended up facilitating it later on, so <laughs> that's what happens when you get involved. But um, yes, I completely would agree with that. I think you, uh, there are, there, it is really polarised and you do have a very, very vocal, very, very scary vocal, loud minority of people, but I don't, I do genuinely believe that it's a small minority. But it is something you need to bear in mind, and I don't know if anyone here came to our talk that we had with the Deputy Mayor of Ghent, who, um, so they are not going to go into details of it, but they basically did a massive transformation, and they more or less did it overnight. They literally did it over the course of a weekend, where they sectioned the city and made the city kind of drive in between to go on the outside, and they improved public transport, they improved cycle um, infrastructure, and people in charge of it got death threats. Like they literally had to have security. So there are, it's definitely true that there are people who are taken very, very seriously in the idea of their cars being taken away from them. But as Jane says, if you put people in the room together and you actually um, give them the tools to discuss it, and I think you find you have a lot, you know, it's a bit fluffy, fluffy dummies and things, but um, you find you have a lot more in common than you, you would find. Yeah, it's a great question, thanks. And I think it's right that we all answer this one. Um, I would ignore social media almost entirely. It's, it's a terrible place to have these sorts of It's fun. Some of us enjoy it, but it, as, in, as a tool for shaping policy, or finding out what people really think, just forget it, totally forget it. Um, and there are people wading into issues which A, they don't know anything about, and B, for, very, for, for all sorts of dodgy reasons. Look at the way that the, the conversation about 15 minutes sitting yeah. was hijacked by a bunch of loonies and far-right activists. You know, anyone who reads about um, this rather modest and inspirational idea of 15 minute cities, which we mentioned here, you know, we need recognise what they were saying, talking about being locked up in their neighbourhoods, not even nonsense. Basically a traditional neighbourhood like one is like this neighbourhood, <laughs> yeah, and which we all grew up in. I just I just feel sorry I, I can hear what you're saying, but I know if my daughter was sat here, she would be of course and looking at the age range of people here to say social media, she'd just be they love it. And, and that's what they would use, the young people, to push forward cycling. So Oh, don't get me wrong, we use it as a tool yeah. for for political for, 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 for propaganda, for polemic. But if you're doing forming policy and consulting people, you need to get them in the room and, and but, but the young people just use social media, don't they? I mean that's their lifeblood, that's their lifeblood. You can recruit them. <laughs> there are ways of getting through to them. Yeah, 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 but all I'm saying is that's what they would use in preference to getting them in the room. Mm. And, and I think that's looking at our age range. Is, is, because it is the young people. Because if you want York to change, it's got to start with the young people. It's got to start with them cycling. It's not just us cycling and pushing it. It's them bringing it with them. So it evolves into... I would say we, we, take, we take a consultation to where young people are. Do one in, in your college. Do one in your university. You find them, you go to them, you bribe them to, to come along and then talk to them. Um, okay, well, I'm not, I'm not we might disagree on this, but yeah. can I make a broader point? The other thing I'd like to say is when you actually survey people and take, take away these debates 
Um, just, you, I think they're highly unrepresented in these debates as well because, as you soon find out, when you get the people in the room, you, you find some consensus. But when you actually survey people, overwhelmingly people want the sort of ideas that we're putting forward. Time and time again, the evidence is there. What you hear is when you polarise it and get on social media, you get this big debate. But actually, all the survey evidence shows, and you can see it in your survey, sort of surveys that um, uh, Tony's been talking about that they've looked into. Uh, you see, nationally, Sustrans does a lot of work on this, and overwhelmingly, people support these kind of measures. So, I think what I would say, um, people are a lot more reasonable because actually, a lot of these things, the measures we're saying, uh, are very sensible. I know some of what we've used here is quite polemical language, and we've done that for a reason because we want to get attention and we want people to engage. But underlying it's a very sensible set of proposals. And I think when you actually have a sensible conversation um, and you provide a form to do that, you can get consensus. And I'll say one last thing we've recently had national council elections. The places where these were really um, highly contested, I'll give you an example, Oxford and Bath, the, the people who stood against it were slaughtered in those local elections. And, the, the, and the, the narrative was like, these things are really unpopular, but actually in Bath, the, um, the council lived down one by a mile, in, 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 and the, 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 I think it was the Conservative Party opposed these, and I think it was a junk on the bandwagon, there was plenty of Conservatives who support these ideas as well. Same thing happened in Oxford. I'm going to have another question. I see some young people in the room who might eyeball the question. Nick, what's your voice? Well, I'm not a young person, but uh, um, notably, the active travel England is now based in York. So, what I'd ask the panel is what conversations have had with active travel England, because that's the government's quango to promote this kind of work. One of the things we're really concerned about is. Council has got funding from Active Travel England, but it has typically then overpriced and over engineered the schemes that it's got funding for and therefore run out of money and not been able to deliver. So, the conversation we want to have is how can you design and achieve these schemes more cost effectively? Um, and uh, all being well, that's something we're going to be pursuing in the next uh, month or so. Well, I've noted that the um, 42 ways doesn't include anything about speed, so I would like to ask the, the team whether they want to add another one or, or maybe why the Total Campaign doesn't support uh, the 20 mile an hour limit on arterial roads as well, because we have got it in York on side roads. But the road outside my house, people bomb up into 40, 50 miles an hour. That's the whole road. So, yeah, thank you. So it's a slightly, slightly complex reason why we didn't use to, um, to um, discuss 2020. And it's because there had been um, research that was done which showed that um, it only was effective to cyclists when it was used in conjunction with other measures, so putting in um, segregated cycleways, um, as well as the 20, for example, as well as the 20 mile an hour limits. <coughs> and we really pride ourselves on being a very scientific based organisation. But um, I think that things have changed in the last five years, and with more 20 mile an hour limits so being brought in across the country, it's become a lot more normalised. And um, with Retrospecting and getting and getting fines and actually things happening when people do break the limits, it's obviously being used. It's being used well. There is ample evidence that perceptions of danger for oneself or for others is the greatest barrier mm. to people taking up cycling. Yeah, yeah. So, mm. all part of your arms and whatever else you've got on the display um, <laughs> in, in making cycling feel safer and partly that speed and we actually in here say there's absolutely no case for having anything more than 20 miles an hour anywhere on or within the inner ring road or on the approaches or in residential roads off the moment we 
we hedge our bets a bit on the outer radial roads and the outer ring roads and so on. But in and around the, the inner city, there's absolutely no case. You can cheat very much by being able to go at 30 uh, on occasion. Um, but it's not just speed, it's separation. Mm -hmm. And this is why we feel so um, frustrated that the council having got funding to separate cyclists from uh, vehicles it has not actually delivered. Um, to reduce the uh, amount of traffic coming into the city on the radial roads around the, <coughs> excuse me, the inner ring road, it strikes me that there is that we need a carrot and a stick. Now the stick would be to reduce the amount of car parking around the ring road, the inner ring road, and so uh, have nowhere to park. But the carrot would be to improve drastically the uh, public transport, bringing people in from the outer ring road, um, park and ride places. Has any consideration ever been given to autonomous trams? Now I know it's been considered in other European cities, and I have thought an autonomous tram network would be trivial compared to autonomous cars, which are becoming a reality. So has anything like that ever been considered? Uh, you will find a diagram in here from one of our colleagues um, who's enthusiastically they've been looking at um, the use of trams in cities elsewhere. We're particularly interested in what's happening in Coventry at the moment because Coventry has the beginnings of a trial of what is called very light rail. What we've suggested in the short term uh, again, this idea of sticks and carrots is that, well, we agree with you on parking, but one of the things to do is to manage the flow of traffic on the radials to give priority immediately inside the park and ride sites to buses and bikes. So that if the queue of cars is going to form, it forms out there, where it's not causing the same problems. Um, I, I've got a lot of experience of, um, of um, transport in Denmark. I'm sure you, you've got that. And I think there's a couple of really important things there. One is that actually the law states that if there's ever an accident involving a bike in a car, the car is at fault. Every junction you come to, the, the, the bike always has a priority. And if you're turning in Denmark, if you're turning right, you have to look at the, at the, at the cycle traffic. And so that, that automatically changes the, the speed at which you drive in a city. I, I, and I think, you know, it, it seems like thinking about how that's integrated into the, the way that we approach transport. It's a shared space. It's not one that's dominated by the car. Um, I've also seen it in other Scandinavian cities where if, if the space is shared no. by all the transport like in Oslo, and that again slows everything down, you respect people um, around you. And, and the other thing I think to consider is that it's not just the bike and the road, it's what do you do when you want to take your bike on a bus? It has, you have to be able to get it on the bus. You have to get it on your train, you cannot do that here. And I think that, that's all part of making this work. Um, and, and so, and, and, you know, it is, again, if you look at, you look at the, 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 the cities, the whole um, road system is set up so that there is always a bike route everywhere, every road, wherever you go. And, and, and that has to have been a part of a long-term strategy. So, you know, it's, it's sort of that, it's, it's almost been being ambitious, taking a lead with this, and, and not just fixing it piecemeal. It's, it's where you really want to go with it. Um, and, 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 that's, and the other thing I want to say, bringing it back to us, is it's great that we have this strategy. Is there something that we can do in the short term to improve what we have? It's a frustration that, you know, it's great to look at the strategy and, and we know there's lots of change, but it would also be good if there was something that we could do now to improve what we've got. And then look at, you know, what funding there is and, and sort of look at what could make the biggest impact short term? I think, I think the reason why we highlighted Ghent 
is because they did it quick and dirty on the cheap, and it's incredibly successful. And I, I think that's why it's such an inspiring example to, you know, that we should look really serious at in York. One of the things we suggested was demonstrator projects. So you take a particular corridor and you reallocate growth space in it. And you demonstrate to people that actually it works. Or, I mean, if you demonstrate it doesn't work, then you have to think again. But, but at least people are seeing something on the ground. In terms of what you can do um, as individuals, um, we have something that we call our water apps scheme um, as part of the cycle campaign, which is that um, different wards people represented depending on where you live. And um, we encourage you to speak to your local councillors and try to take them out on the cycle ride and show them um, the good and bad infrastructure in the area immediately so that they can get a, a direct example, they can see what the problems are and where it is, especially if you know somebody with an adapted cycle or a trike or something which will find it trickier to go through certain barriers or up, up stairs. So it's, that's, that's more grassroots stuff, but that's something you can do. Um, we've talked a bit about the 20 mile an hour limit, uh, obviously it would be good to have more of these, but um, we have it in our area, in the Scarborough Road area, and people regularly speed along there. I understand that it's not the policy of North Yorkshire Police to do anything about it, so you know, it's not, not exactly the best thing to have. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is, is you talked about carrots and sticks. Um, we gave up our car 15 years ago, we, we walk, we cycle, we bus and trains. There's one thing that we find a bit difficult, which is going to the tip. <laughs> um, sometimes we walk there, it's not an ideal we could have had this perfect little area to put things in. But if you've got anything bigger, um, what do you do with it? And I would like to see, say, a, a voucher where if you didn't have a car, you could get a free, free pickup for tip items once a year. So it's little things like that that I think would help. Yeah, I agree. Can I have that? Um, wave 37, reward residents for adopting alternative yeah. transport. It's um, something we do. I'd just like to add though, I recently went to the tip and I took a, a basin and a basin pedestal and a few very large things of pay to the tip and an electric cargo ride which Luckily, I have access to because we own one shop and we move stock around between our sites on it. Um, the other thing, number 38, um, if you go to Ghent, you can go to a bike hub and you can hire one of these giant cargo bikes. They're electric powered, they're really easy to ride, they take huge um, uh, cargo, mass cargo, some of them, and you can hire it for like a tenner a day. And so, again, that's another one of our proposals. When you think of the, the cost of creating a central bike hub with all these amazing bikes in York, it would, could be like a really fancy one, it would be a couple of million. It could probably self-fund itself after a while with a tweak it bit. When you look at the, the road infrastructure budget, so York alone, for its outer ring road, one lane, 65 million. Instead, we, when we say in here, we're just pointing out, we're not saying we're against it, we're kind of neutral on it, if it fits into a, a, a decent transport strategy, but we're pointing out you can get 65 million to build one and the, basically all, uh, two lanes. And, and, and you can imagine what the Yorks all around the country are getting this kind of budget. And then the whole budget, the entire country, is, is a couple hundred million. I mean, it's, it's crazy, it's absurd, and it's outrageous, and it's obscene. And you know, we really need to speak up about this and use it from the moment we learn and kick off because we can have all these things. We can have a bike up for like, you know, for, for bread, you know, for nothing. It's cheap as chips compared with all this other stuff. London already um, has powers to allow the London boroughs to enforce speeding, red light running, um, yellow box running, um, and it's now being um, spread out to local authorities elsewhere. Um, and at the moment, in a typical government cack-handed approach to doing it, rather than saying everybody can do it, they're saying, well, we'll have bids from local authorities. Right. You're put in a bid, and it said, well, we'll enforce the right turn ban out of Lendl onto Museum Street as an exemplar. 
I wouldn't have started there myself. <laughs> when you look at the, the amount of red light running and the amount of, of, of speeding in 20 mile an hour areas, we should be able to put in a bid that says, this is how we want our streets to run, and we want to encourage people to abide by that. Let's get the powers to do it. And technology permits you to do it very easily now. Just, I've just returned from Cornwall, and they've got villages there that have got to 20 mile, and they have a, a camera. And as yep. I go in, it gave up my license plate and said, You're under the speed limit, thank you. And so it, got, it flashed your license plate up, and I don't know why we can't do that in York. So you wouldn't need the police, you would have a camera that picks up your license plate. If you're over the 20 mile, it flashes, and you get obviously a fine. That's exactly the sort of application I'm thinking of. Yeah. Uh, a few years ago, we cycled from Switzerland to Holland with our grandchildren who were seven and eight. And we had no problem with cycle lanes. We had no problem with traffic. It was fantastic. We felt safe all the time. They cycled on their own. It was just fantastic. We really were. Yeah. And that's what we want for York. Absolutely. I mean, what we, what we hear about things like this have been done in other cities and other countries, and we're not embracing it here, it's very hard to believe that we have a council and police force who actually do care for motor vehicles because when the when the alternatives exist and they are financially viable. So um, it's yeah, it's a mystery. I, I think we're probably gonna draw it to a close there. Um, thank you so much everyone for coming. Before you um, go we will show you how to join the your cycle campaign. So just very quickly, it's five pounds for the year um, for the membership, that's it. And that just goes to pay for the running of the campaign. Um, that's it, everyone who's involved is a volunteer. We just do it because we really, really care. You need to, to sign up, follow us on Twitter, follow us on Facebook, get involved, and we'd love to see you. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you.